It's perhaps the greatest question of all. Where do all things great and small come from? And why are they so bright and beautiful? All cultures in the world have their own creation story. But I want to talk about a very different explanation for the living world. It's called the theory of evolution by natural selection. The theory of evolution is mainly the work of Charles Darwin, who published it in 1859. But why should we believe in evolution? Well, there's only one good reason to believe in anything, and that's evidence. And there's a massive amount of evidence for Darwin's theory of evolution. But it's not all direct evidence. You could hardly expect to have eyewitness evidence for something that happened so long ago. It's rather more like a detective coming upon the scene of a crime after a murder has been committed and working out how it must have happened because all the clues are exactly the way you'd expect if that's the way it really did happen. But before we go into Darwin's theory itself, we need to be clear exactly what he was trying to do. He was trying to explain not just the origin of species, but also the fantastic variety of species that have ever existed on this earth. And that brings us to the first kind of evidence, the fossil evidence. Fossils are the remains of prehistoric animals and plants preserved in the rock. Usually they are hard parts, like this shell. So the fossil record is actually the history of life on Earth. We can date all of the rocks in the Earth, and we find that the very oldest rocks contain the simplest fossils, about 3,500 million years ago. If we look at a specific example, this very old plant, more than 300 million years old, this is part of its bark. We don't find plants living like that today. This leaf from a flowering plant is found in rocks of about 50 million years ago. The earliest flowering plants don't go back any further in the fossil record. They only occur at that time. And they're the kind of plants we see around us today. So the fossils in the rocks actually record the changes that have happened to animals and plants through time. If we look at a sequence of fossils through time, we can see changes in features that have led from one animal group to another. This fossil is a reptile belonging to the group that we think mammals evolved from. This specimen is about 240 million years old. Here are the chewing teeth and they're relatively simple. It also has a long stabbing tooth here and nipping tooth at the front. If we look at the modern tiger's teeth, we can see here that the chewing teeth have evolved into very strong prong-like structures for chewing meat and bone, as well as having the stabbing teeth and nipping teeth at the front of the mouth. So these gradual changes through time in the teeth and all the other features of the skull actually demonstrate to us that evolution has happened in the fossil record. And what Darwin did was actually find an explanation for how it happened. Very briefly, here's how natural selection works. In every species, there's variations. Some individuals are big, some are small. Some are fast, some are slow. And some of that variation is inherited. So in every generation, most of the children will be born to those animals that have what it takes to survive and reproduce and those children will tend to inherit what it takes. So as the generations go by, the average animal in the population gets a little bit better. Now, what other evidence did Darwin have? Well, we humans have been adapting domestic animals and plants for a long time. The breeding of racehorses is an example of artificial selection. Only those horses which are successful on the track are selected for breeding, so a horse will tend to inherit good racing characteristics from both its parents. When the process is repeated over many generations, it produces a breed of horses which is specifically adapted to racing. This is a thoroughbred racehorse 
and she's built essentially for speed. And there's certain things about her, looking at her overall, that make her specifically a racehorse as opposed to an ordinary horse. She's quite lightly built in herself. She's not carrying a lot of weight. She doesn't have very big bones, but she has some very large muscles. This mare hasn't been racing for many years, but you can still see here on her shoulder some very strong muscles and also coming down to her hindquarters, again, very powerful for racing. She has quite small, quite thin legs. Again, she's very much an athlete as opposed to a working horse. Here on her head, you can see she's quite thick set through her jaw and on her face, her nostrils are quite wide. And this is to allow her to get as much air in as possible when she's racing at high speeds. Artificial selection causes racehorses to evolve. Good racing characteristics spread throughout the population because horses with weaker characteristics are not selected for breeding. In artificial selection, there's a human eye doing the choosing, deciding which individuals shall survive and breed. In natural selection, it's just plain survival that counts. Artificial selection produced the racehorse from the wild horse in a matter of a few centuries. Natural selection produced the horse from an ancestor about the size of a small dog in some tens of millions of years. Now, if selection can shape animals, what about machines? These robots are doing something which you and I would find very simple. They're just trying to wander around without bumping into things. But if we try to program the robots to do that, it's actually very, very difficult because there are millions of possible situations which the robots might find themselves in. Evolution gives us a way around that very hard problem. These robots can be given a huge variety of different characteristics. For instance, when they meet an obstacle, some of them might turn left, some of them might turn right, and some might go backwards. And also, they have these little infrared detectors, which are like their eyes. So there can be a variety of eyesights in the robots where some are better than others. With a large population of robots, some are bound to be better than others at avoiding obstacles. So we select the better ones and we breed them. And in the breeding, the computer programs which control the robots are mixed up from two parents to give a child. And this means that the child inherits characteristics from the parents, and so in the next generation, the robots are better at avoiding obstacles. This process is repeated again and again, so that over successive generations, the robots get better and better at avoiding obstacles. To avoid spending lots of time fiddling with robots, we can work in computer simulations. This is a simulation of a predator and a prey. The red one is the predator and the yellow one is the prey. What you just saw was generation zero. So they just have random characteristics and they're not very good at doing the jobs we want them to do. The yellow one's not running away from the red one and the red one's not particularly good at chasing the yellow one. You can imagine that with a variety of robots, there's bound to be some which, in some small way, are good at doing what we want them to do. So we select those and we allow them to breed. Each generation of robots is only slightly better than the last. But after 200 generations, they're quite good. Here we see the results after 200 generations. And the red one is chasing the yellow one, and the yellow one is running away from the red one. But the red one runs out of power halfway through the chase. So there's still some room for improvement. After 1,000 generations of evolution, the robots are very well adapted to their task and they're descendants of the original robots. As you can see, the red one chases the yellow one and the yellow one runs away from the red one. And they'll both run out of power at almost exactly the same time because they're equally well evolved. Now, we don't know what the mechanisms are inside these robots that make them perform this task. The important thing to realize is that we have said what the task is, but it's evolution which has created the robots which perform that task. 
It may seem hard to believe that animals as complicated as these could evolve in the way that I've been saying. But that's because we're not very good at understanding the immensity of time that's been available for it all to happen. Domestic dogs and horses have evolved by artificial selection in a few hundred generations. But life has been going on this planet for about 4,000 million years, and that's plenty of time. Now, the key to evolution lies in every cell of every one of us, and it's called DNA. A DNA molecule is shaped like a double helix. A long strand of DNA contains many pairs of smaller molecules called bases. If you could unwind the double helix, the pairs of bases would be arranged like the rungs of a ladder. There are four different bases called C, G, A and T for short. These are the four letters of the genetic alphabet and they can be arranged in any order. You can think of this arrangement as a genetic code containing all the instructions for making a living organism. There might be billions of letters. By analysing DNA, we can test one of Charles Darwin's most controversial ideas, that humans and chimpanzees are descended from the same ancestor. When an animal reproduces, its DNA gets passed on to the next generation, that very DNA that made it successful at surviving and reproducing in the first place. Every now and again, rarely, there's a random mistake in the copying of DNA called a mutation. And mutation, together with the shuffling of DNA that happens in sexual reproduction, spreads the variation through the population. Now, if a variation is advantageous, say it gives a predator better eyesight or something, then that's the DNA that will go forward to the next generation. So it's changes in DNA that drive evolution forward. Now, if Darwin is right, and humans and chimpanzees are very close relatives, then we should expect to see that their DNA is very similar. You can analyse the DNA from the cells of any organism. These cells could be extracted from animal blood or plant tissue or ground up centipedes. Mammoths have been extinct for thousands of years, but someone found a frozen one in Siberia. You could extract DNA from this and compare it to the DNA from elephant droppings. To analyse my own DNA, I would start with cells from the inside of my cheek. Scientists can extract DNA from cells and then cut it up into fragments using special chemical techniques. When these fragments are separated, they can be used to work out the genetic code contained in the DNA. This means that the DNA from different species can be compared. The order of these fragments of DNA correspond to the order of the different letters of the genetic code. It's much easier to analyse these results on the computer. The top line of letters here is what my own genetic code looks like, though it's only a small part of my DNA. We can compare this with the genetic code of a chimpanzee here along the bottom. The two sets of DNA are very similar. In fact, there's only one change here in the stretches of letters that we have here on the screen. If we looked at all my DNA, we would see that 98% of it is identical to that of a chimpanzee. This is very strong evidence that humans and chimpanzees have a common ancestor. The fossil record suggests that this common ancestor was alive five million years ago. A chimpanzee is one thing, but let's compare my DNA with that of a fly. This piece of DNA helps to control which part of a fly's body a cell belongs to, a leg or an antenna or the head or the abdomen. Now my DNA on the top here contains almost exactly the same string of letters. 
The same piece of DNA that tells a fly where to grow wings controls the growth of my arms and legs. In fact, there are many other similarities between these two sets of DNA. And this is really amazing evidence that humans and flies have a common ancestor. We think that this common ancestor lived about 600 million years ago. According to the theory of evolution, life originally began on Earth in a very simple form. Over the last 4,000 million years, natural selection has acted on these simple ancestors to create the fantastic variety of life we see on Earth today. The theory of evolution seems incredible. Is there enough evidence? One criticism of the fossil record as evidence for evolution is that it is incomplete. There are gaps in it. But we must remember that fossils can only be found in certain kinds of rocks and are only formed under certain conditions. We're finding new fossils every year to help plug those gaps and they all tell us the same story. The simplest fossils are found in the oldest rocks and more complex fossils are found in recent rocks. Each fossil that we find fits in with that story. We never find a fossil that is out of sequence. All living things contain different versions of the same molecule, DNA. So the instructions for making different organisms are all written in the same basic code. By comparing this DNA, we can see relationships and similarities in every single organism on Earth. This is very strong evidence that all organisms are related and have evolved from a single common ancestor. I believe that Darwin's theory of evolution is the best possible explanation for the existence of all life on Earth. But the great thing about a scientific theory is that you don't have to take my word for it, or even the word of a genius like Charles Darwin. You can go and look at the evidence and decide for yourself.